Welcome back to Smart Reads. Today's book is called The Witness Tree. It is a novel by John Loftus and Brendan Howley. It is something that I read many, many years ago. It was published in 2007. I had read it because I, I'm not used, uh, I usually don't read novels. They're not a big thing that I like to invest time into. However, when you read the, the books of a researcher and then you, know, you learn that he wrote a novel based on the research documents to kind of tell the story of what he found, it's a really elegant solution to be able to provide the average everyday reader with an understanding of how some very dry legal banking documents actually stack up to bodies stacking up on the other side of the world in something we call World War II. So there's an intimate connection between the research that Loftus was doing, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about his background. He's going to tell you a little bit about his background even more. I'm going to read from you, uh, read from the inside of the jacket for you guys so you have an understanding of the book before we get into it. And then I'm going to limit my quotations from the book to a couple of strategic areas that don't give away the overall plot unnecessarily. Although John might do that in the video clip. I'm not sure what all he covers in there. It's been a couple years. Um, and then uh, the other unusual thing we're going to do with this is before we dig into any quoting from the book, after we watch the video clip of John, we're going to read from the postscript because there is a spoiler involved. It's not to do with the plot, but I think it has to do with the quality of the source of information from which the novel is crafted. And at the end, it is disclosed, here's the reality of all these situations. For purposes of smart reads, it's better to know what is the real situation and then how is it fictionalized and laid out so people can understand it. Because that's the art form of it, the fictionalization, writing the narrative so that people can understand it and actually have time to consume and understand the story. And the actual and factual part is the research documents, the NATO documents, the Stasi documents, the KGB documents that are used. Uh, and the informants and the operatives that were interviewed to make this story. So that's why it's interesting. So uh, at this point, I'm going to cut to the book cam real quick. We'll read the inside flap, which is very short. And then we can cut over to uh, the quick intro of the footage I shot with John Loftus. Now, will it reach? No, it won't. So we're going to tilt the camera, then we'll tilt it back in a second here. A political thriller and love story that connects the beginnings of modern Israel to the dark secrets of an American political dynasty. As a Nazi war crimes investigator, John Loftus unearthed many sinister truths about mid-century America, the most surprising of which has been whispered to him by an aging Haganah agent. The secret of that could utterly reshape the modern history of Israel. Dramatized and told here for the first time, the witness tree is that story. For many years before the Second World War, a handful of operatives have sought the partition of Palestine, a crack in the Middle Eastern map that would allow them to re rebuild the Jewish homeland. Across the ocean, Eleanor Dulles, Ele <clears throat> across the ocean, Eleanor Dulles is an economist and a socialist, an unlikely rebel in a respected Protestant family that has already produced two secretaries of state. Her brothers, two of the most powerful lawyers on Wall Street, and their top client, a young Nelson Rockefeller, have been quietly securing... Uh, <clears throat> Have been, uh, have been quietly securing his German investments against the prospects of war. And for a few determined men without a country, made desperate by Europe's rising violence against their people, the idealistic and recently widowed Eleanor looks like, uh, looks like a way to turn such dealings into blackmail and a future. From decades of research by Loftus and co-author Brendan Howley comes this epic page-turner about the people who define the very hope and treachery of the 20th century, as imagined through the life of a woman who becomes the conscience of her family and redeems the soul of a nation betrayed. So with that flap now being read, uh, let's go ahead and cut over to the video of John Loftus. I filmed this in... 
think it was April, May, or June of 2016. It's still in raw footage. This is the 11 minutes of footage that I have assembled. It gives you a bit of his bio, but specifically I brought these pieces of raw footage together throughout the two days that we filmed because it gave a good, concise illustration of the Dulles family in John's own words. My name is John Loftus. I uh, was an Army officer, a federal prosecutor at the headquarters of the Justice Department in Washington. And then I worked for the Office of Special Investigations, which was the Nazi War Crimes Unit that was set up during the Carter and Reagan administrations. And uh, unfortunately, I discovered that many of the Nazis I'd been assigned to prosecute were already on the government payroll. So uh, ended up being a whistleblower. And uh, in 1982, I appeared on an Emmy Award-winning segment of 60 Minutes. Uh, Mike Wallace got the Emmy Award. My family got the death threats. It was a great trade-off. And uh, after that, I went to private practice in law in Boston and set up my own law firm for a while. But over the years, I've become a uh, private lawyer for whistleblowers. And I charge my clients a dollar apiece. I'm the worst paid lawyer in America, but among the better informed. As in order to be a client, you have to have a security clearance above top secret. I had a Q clearance for nuclear weapons secrets, an SI clearance, which is the uh, wiretapping NSA, clearance, and a cosmic clearance for everything in NATO that was top secret and above. So I could read the British intelligence files and the Dutch intelligence files, as well as the American files. And uh, so I was the first person in a half a century that was able to go through the classified vaults where all these old intelligence files are stored. And they're stored out in Suitland, Maryland, an interesting place. There were 20 security vaults underground, like bank vaults. And each vault is one acre in size. Uh, it's a little bit of, remember the, the last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark? Well, that's where the underground vaults are like, only not as organized. But uh, I was looking for something unique, not just for files about Nazi war criminals, but evidence that might suggest that the hunt for Nazi war criminals had been obstructed. Evidence that the trials had been fixed. My first boss was a prosecutor of the Nuremberg trials, the bankers' trial. And he was the one who told me that he thought the trials had been fixed, that resources were taken away from him and the other people who were investigating the banks and uh, forcing them to close down some of their investigations. So he and I had both been army officers who had intelligence training. And so I had two jobs. One was to investigate Nazis from the nation of Belarus that might have immigrated to America, and also to look for evidence of this, who fixed the Nuremberg trials. Yeah. And the two sort of clashed together, which is why I ended up in 60 Minutes. What did you discover, and why have you de dedicated the last 40 years of your life to exposing these secrets? Mm. I discovered that a small corrupt group of American officials worked with the British Secret Service to relocate Nazi war criminals to the United States. Now, to be fair, they didn't really realize they were Nazi war criminals on the American side. The British knew they were. But the British said, look, we have all these great spy rings in Eastern Europe and in the Arab states. And they may have fought with the Germans in the last war, but these people are not really Nazis. They only fought with the Germans because they hated the Russians, communists more. They're really anti-communist freedom fighters. And uh, some of the dimwits in our State Department, they, they, they bought that. And so we took over the British networks after World War II, not realizing that the British weren't sending us freedom fighters. They were sending us the dregs of the Nazi war criminals from the Arab states and from Eastern Europe. They were recruiting ex-Nazi terrorists to fight World War III. And it was one of the most stupid and corrupt things that had ever done. But as I dug deeper and deeper in the files, I realized it really had nothing much to do with ideology. 
This is all about money. You know, it, Dulles wasn't just the nitwit that got conned by Kim Philby into letting Nazi war criminals relocate to America. Alan Dulles was a Wall Street corrupt corporate lawyer. And they had their own agenda. It wasn't about national security at all. It was about bankers' security. It was all about the money. It was about setting up new cartels, monopolies, and trusts. Um, you know, they, in the British dominated, for example, the oil fields on the Arabian Peninsula. So uh, we used guys like Alan Dulles, who then was in our State Department, and we arranged to send guns and ammunition to uh, this rebel group of tribesmen led by Ibn Saud, and that became the House of Saud. And we, we literally gave them the guns to put themselves in power in the 1930s. And they took over Mecca and Medina. Um, unfortunately, their religious mindset was somewhere to the right of Attila the Hun. They had a philosophy called Wahhabism or Salafism, which has been declared a heresy against Islam you know, more than 60 times before 1900. But once they had oil, you know, all of a sudden the Saudis could buy legitimacy. The Dulles brothers have now borrowed under the government. Truman's been reelected. They have to hide the Nazi connection. They have to hide the Saudi connection. They have to hide the Bolshevik connection. And it's business as usual. But it's not about an ideological conspiracy. I mean, they were funding the communists at the same time as they were funding the Nazis for this handful of really greedy people in Wall Street. It was just about making money. So in the intelligence agency practices, uh, best practices of the world over history, uh, it offers plausible deniability when they externalize and use these other factions to kind of do their dirty work. Yes? Yeah, over... It's useful in a long period of time to have a proxy army, if you will. For example, um, there was an Arab Nazi movement, and it was called the, the Muslim Brotherhood, run by a guy named Hassan al-Banna, and he founded it in 1928. And he was a real admirer of Adolf Hitler, wrote him letters all the time to the young Hitler, saying, I like your philosophy, I read your book. We got to work together, and they did. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood became the arm of the Abwehr, the German intelligence network, in the Middle East. The Muslim Brotherhood were Nazi spies all over the Middle East, and they went from a half a million members to three quarters of a million members. And Philby sold them to the Dulles Brothers, and uh, the when Nasser. And the secularists came to power in Egypt in the 1950s. They had this huge army of Nazis running around their country, and they threw them out. And Dulles went to the Saudis, who were his business clients, and asked them to take them in. And this gets really funny here. The Saudis agreed because the, at least the Egyptian Nazis and the Muslim Brotherhood Nazis were literate. So the Saudis gave them job as school teachers at the madrasas. And so young men like Osama bin Laden were literally educated by first-generation Nazis. And the brother of the chief Nazi propagandist, Qutub, was the guy who was the tutor for Osama bin Laden. So you had a perfect storm of Nazi racism and Saudi religious bigotry coming together with the relocation of the Muslim Brotherhood to Saudi Arabia. And this is the same Muslim Brotherhood that, you know, they were still fighting recently in Egypt. They never went away. Um, this is the second generation Nazis are there. When you think about it, the Muslim Brotherhood and its offshoots, Al-Qaeda and Hamas, they are the same philosophy. They're, they're against democracy, against Western civilization. They hate the English and the Americans and above all the Jews. So nothing has changed. Uh, we're still fighting in the Middle East because Philby conned us on Dulles into taking over the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, that was going to be his proxy army of terrorists to fight the communist terrorists in the Middle East. And boy, did we get suckered in. Well, let's talk about the Dulles Brothers for a second. You state that 
Alan Dulles was one of the worst traders in American history. Uh, can you talk about the Dulles brothers in the context of the 20s, 30s, and 40s? In the 20s, 30s, and 40s, the Dulles brothers were helping the Wall Street robber barons take their money out of the United States and relocate it to friendly foreign fascists, you know, whether it was Saudi or, or even the Bolsheviks in Russia or the German fascists, because they could reestablish the monopolies that these guys loved. But also, they knew that, you know, as Hitler came to power, he was turning on them. And the very first law that Hitler passed when he came to power was to ban foreign ownership of German companies. So the Dulles brothers went to work on cloaking. And they set up Swiss companies in a Swiss bank that would own the stock of German banks. And it was the German banks that would own the stock of the German corporations. So that's how they got around the Hitler's block. Hitler's finance minister, by the way, Hallmar Schacht, was born in Brooklyn. And, you know, it's another business associate of the Dulles Brothers. The, uh, you know, it was all about the money in those days. 70% of the money that went to rebuild the Third Reich came from Wall Street and from the city of London. Wall Street and the city of London. That's interesting, right? We're not told that history in school. Uh, during that clip, it's only 11 minutes, number of things that I got to unpack before we can even get back to the book. First off, he's talking about Kim Philby, who was part of the Cambridge Five spy ring in the 1950s, selling Alan Dulles these Arab Nazis. Well, he has to also, in that clip, uh, connect it with St. John Sinjin Philby, Kim Philby's dad, who's the one who worked with Ibn Saud to create the Saudi kingdom in the first place, to have those Arab Nazis that his son could sell to Alan Dulles. Um, the Wahhabism of the Saudis, that rises up again with 9-11. So this is a story still being unfolded in, an under, in order to understand the events of our day. We have to have a contextual history of what are these proxy armies. And when I was listening to that, the next book we're going to cover, I picked it up off the shelf. We'll do this in two weeks. Secret Affairs, Britain's Collusion with Radical Islam by Mark Curtis. He is a member of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. This is not a conspiratorial book. This is a factual book published by they, them, those in the establishment. In here, it also talks about how Osama bin Laden had a headquarters in London in 1996. And the MI6 and these groups were working with those Saudi proxy groups that they use conveniently to stir up trouble, create terrorism. Um, that brings us into on the other end. So we have all the way up to present day, these these adverse effects from the causalities of World War II, Cold War, that we don't understand yet. But to really get to the root, you have to go back to Paris 1919, because all those things that were going on in the 20s and 30s about the American money going over to the fascist nations to fund them, that, that was part of the Great Depression here. All the resource capital going to another place where hyperinflation had already happened because of Paris 1919 and the reorganization of all those states after World War I. The Dulles brothers were at Versailles. They were uh, the part of the, the American delegation at Versailles. So why were they there? Because they already had famous family members that were like Secretary of State, Secretary of War. They were born into a political family. So um, the other thing I thought of is as they're talking, as uh, Loftus is talking about the restructuring of those banks via Switzerland so that they could move the Nazi assets. That flows down to today with these shell companies and uh, uh, Masik Fonseca, that leak that happened with uh, was a Panamanian law firm. Uh, there's a recent movie called The Laundromat with uh, uh, Gary Oldman and several other very uh, high-ranking actors in this ludicrous story of shell companies, and they show you how it unfolds. So even if you see something like that today as entertainment, it goes back to Dulles and Rockefeller and these guys learning how to leverage Swiss banks to move assets out of countries that they were going to go to war with. So now that we have unpacked all that, we're ready to dig into the book. Let's see here. The preface is I'm jumping in a good way into the book, so I don't want to spoil the beginning. But let me unfold part of what happens right before the first part that I'm going to read. Alan and John Foster Dulles are brothers. They have a sister, Eleanor Dulles. She's kind of a socialist leaning member of the family, like, uh, almost like a black sheep against their Protestantism. Uh, she dates somebody 
who's uh, probably a socialist, uh, is not a Protestant, and her brothers, they take subject with that. Her suit her has an untimely demise, is the best way to say it. That is covered in detail in this novel, based on the evidence that Howley and Loftus had amalgamated through like 30 years of history uh, research into these documents. So I'm not going to cover the details of that story. The first part that I thought we should jump into is this part that says part 20. I notice it's in Roman numerals. That to me is uh, also, I don't know if John intended it this way or if this is how the format worked out with where this letter falls, but the double cross system of World War II involved the same characters that are telling in this story, and it involved British intelligence and uh, nascent Israeli intelligence and German intelligence in the double cross system. And Nelson Rockefeller Rockefeller worked in psychological warfare during World War II as part of the double cross system. It's the Anglophiles in the intelligence system of the American intelligence apparatus. Those are the players like James Hesus Angleton. He got to be part of that double cross. In America, it was called X2. It's still two X's, right? Two X's. 20, they called it the 20 committee because Roman numerals, double X's, 20. Here we are, June 1936. Let me see if I can adjust the camera so I can get the relevant parts of the page in there. Quick adjustment for your pleasure. And... I need it just a little bit higher so I can get the edits right there. All right, cool. And, uh, yeah, it'll all show up on there. Do it live. Close my pen. The symbiotic Allen savored his visits to 26 Broadway, the oil capital of the world. The penthouse office was a prince's lair. Nelson Rockefeller's private dining room at his family's head offices was gently lit with elegant tapers and a minimum of electric light. A butler came and went silently on crepe soles, bearing silver trays, while Allen and his client talked, referring to a file Rockefeller had open to his right. They had reached dessert. Kona Blue Mountain Coffee, a perfect flaky galette, and an ensignette. Uh, quote, I'm of the opinion that sooner or later there's going to be a war, Nelson, Allen said, choosing his subdued tone, the one he used for the heavyweight client closings. Could be five or ten years from now, but everything I see says a war with Germany. I was just there a month ago for a disarmament conference. The Rhineland is just the start for Hitler. Rockefeller said nothing, listening, a thumb across his lips, sealing his thoughts. Rockefeller turned a page. Okay, there's a war. What if we do want to move our money around that's parked in Switzerland? Says here that you're recommending the Bank for International Settlements. We are, Alan agreed. We've worked out a few wrinkles there, too. The idea, the idea is really implicit in the standard Farben share swap. There's no reason why your standard Farben royalty flows shouldn't go through Switzerland to the Bank of International Settlements and then on to New York, and vice versa for the standard outflows from Germany. We've got almost 40% ownership of the Thiessen Bank shares via Chase, Rockefeller is now saying. That's correct. Chase, New York, holds 38% of Thiessen's cross holdings in Farben. Allen took a sip of his ansonette, letting it linger. So, you and Foz are proposing to cloak the standards German oil holdings with Swiss, with a Swiss holding company here in the United States to protect the 38? Rockefeller slapped his hand down on the file. I like it. I don't like Sweden. And Portugal's too close to Spain. I see those Spanish Reds just ship their entire gold reserve to the Mo- to Moscow. Jesus, they'll never see that again. You ask me, Alan replied, flee, flee, feelingly. <laughs> Stalin got his start robbing banks, didn't he? Rockefeller leaned back in his chair. 
Bank secrecy makes all kinds of sense. But how does the Swiss end work? Moving money around, I mean. How do I know my business is secure while there is a war on? The Swiss banks are the latest. Uh, the Swiss banks use the latest coding communications, the best around. Nelson, we use the same machines ourselves at Sullivan and Cromwell. Rockefeller tapped the table with a fingertip. So you're convinced there's going to be a war. You'll be cloaking all kinds of corporate trade, won't you? Good for business, right? Actually, Alan said quietly, most of Wall Street have enough on their plates just keeping their heads above water. And the State Department? They're all ostriches. Nobody wants to know. You'd be ahead of the game. I see your old friend Norman Davis is running the Council on Foreign Relations. He figures Hitler's not going to stop until he's got Austria and maybe even Czechoslovakia, too. Alan, polish, polishing off his galette, nodded. Who can afford a war with Europe these days? Except Hitler. We have a real client in that Ger German Air Force, Rockefeller mused. They need leaded aviation fuel. And lots of it. And that's our patent. Alan could see Nelson's gears going. All the more reason to cloak like this, he observed. A really fine dessert and a superb venison, Nelson. We fly men from upstate. Nothing but fresh killed at this table, I'll tell you that. Let's see, man, getting it on the page. Just a little adjustment. Nelson closed the cloaking file and pondered its cover for a moment. Right. Let's keep on with this cloaking neutrality idea for some, uh, uh, some more. Here's what I hear on the standard grapevine. Caracas, Bogota, Mexico City, the South American countries are going to follow the Vatican's lead and stay out of it if Europe goes up, aren't they? So now we see the Vatican coming in as a player on the table. The state men tell me, yes, yes, they will. The Pope's made it quite clear that the real enemy is the Bolsheviks. My best information says that they'll stay neutral. But that's only part of the story, Alan continued. No point pumping oil if you can't sell it and your tankers are on, alien proper, are, are on the alien property custodians list. Everybody's got to be able to move with a war on. Otherwise, you're hamstrung by currency restrictions or even flat-out confiscation. Rockefeller nodded, poker-faced, waiting while the servant cleared. Tell me, what's Schroeder doing? Prescott Bush over at Brown Brothers is jumping up and down, telling me, uh, telling, uh, telling me we should be looking for a bank that'll go both ways. Well, sure, Alan agreed, warming to his theme. Nothing new. The big German industrialists started doing it in 1917. The smart ones... August Thiessen, among them, getting the ownership paperwork into neutral cloaks to beat the armistice reparations claims, his son Fritz has made an art of it, used the money to put Hitler in power, bought and paid for, thinks he's entitled to a break on the Nazi tax rates. I hear Fritz got his real profits stash, stashed offshore, well away from the Nazi tax auditors. Someplace convenient, I hear, like, Brussels or Amsterdam. Rockefeller thumbed through the file again, thinking, And a war? Well, neutral paperwork is your safety valve. When you're ready, you lift the cloaks, and there are the profits, safe and sound, ready to repatriate. And it means that you can move oil profits around easily, too, from neutral to neutral. Handy if you've got a patent or dividend outflows in harm's way. Rockefeller held Allen with a steady gaze. What's the risk? Waiting. We know little from the outside about how the alien property issues play out, you see. Foster helped run the alien property commissioner's office in 1917. So Allen's brother, Foster, back in 1917, before the 1919 armistice, they're already working on how to divvy up everybody's everything else. Allen shook his head slowly. Let's, see, let's get this back over here. Feeling his bed, belly pressing against his waistband. 
And we have Washington Wired on Cloaking Matters, right down to the committee tablings. That's our bread and butter down there. The existing language is Appendix 3. If you want a second opinion about the details of moving profits offshore, there's Fletcher at Polk, Davis, and Wardell. Something this big, count on it. Who else are you doing this for? That's privileged, Alan murmured. <laughs> but a few big Fortune 100 names run past me. Rockefeller lifted himself. I'm sorry. Rockefeller listed a half dozen household names of American industry and finance. Alan merely smiled. Then, abruptly, the evening was over. Rockefeller stood, flipping his nap napkin aside. Fine. Draw up the papers, he ordered. Then you walk me through them. You must excuse me, Alan. I've got another appointment. He gestured to the richly polished doors. Now, why don't you... Uh, <laughs> Now, why don't you and the boys move Sullivan and Cromwell uptown to our new center, Rockefeller Center. Give you a hell of a deal on rent, and your staff will love the offices. I helped design them myself. Lots of light, lots of space, air conditioning, fast elevators. Won't find a better office in the city, or the world, for that matter. Alan chuckled ruefully. I'd move in a flash, you know me. Nelson laughed and nodded as, as Alan walked out. Well, if you fellows change your mind, you know where to call. He stopped and patted Alan on the shoulder. Best to Foster and your wife. See you at the Yacht Club this weekend? Should do, Alan said, allowing the butler to help him into his overcoat. We're racing. Give old Smithson a run for his money if we get the right wind. Remember me to marry. Nelson closed the door as Alan left, turned and opened a side door to a small sitting room with a view of Broadway, bright with lights. There. Jammed lankily into a quite ex exquisite hepplewhite chair, Prescott Bush grinned. To his left, bent over the backgammon table, considering his next move, sat the poker-faced Dutch banker Rennie Shippers, two money men in the anteroom of a prince. Let's see. Now, now, Nelson said, let's not give Alan a reputation, a bad reputation in front of our Dutch guest. I know all about Mr. Dulles, thank you, Shippers replied. That's good, said Bush, appraising his position on the board. Shippers rolled poorly yet again. That's even better, Bush said, pleased. I'm up 82 for the night. Now he's telling Nelson his uh, backgammon score. For now, I'd watch him, Press. These Dutchmen are all short arms and deep pockets. Bet you didn't know our friend here is Fritz Thiessen's man in Rotterdam. Did so, Bush countered. Who else make who else you making money for, Benny or Rennie? Rockefeller settled himself in the Chase Lounge. I'd have thought that you'd have that one figured out, Press. Me. Let's hear the latest from Berlin, Rennie. It's all about you, Mr. Rockefeller, Shippers replied, not looking up from the game board game board. Well, Nelson said, lighting a cigarette, I guess I'd better have another drink in me before I hear the news. The rumor is, Shippers began, that you and I.G. Farben were swapping stock, Mr. Rockefeller, to cover the handover of patents and royalties for synthetic oil. Standard and Farben, the two biggest chemical concerns on the globe, married at last. It's a big, big deal, Bush said. One for the history books. I could use a piece of it, Nelson. Rockefeller ignored Bush sliding the cigarette lighter over to Shippers, who lit a rough-looking rough Brazilian cigarillo. Now, the banker's question, said Shippers, we're speaking about standards, oil revenues, and royalties. How do you get that kind of money out of Hitler's Germany, Mr. Rockefeller? Roosevelt's got all kind of smart lawyers, Rockefeller began, unhurried now, with nothing better to do than to sniff out that exactly, especially if a war is on. So that's where my dinner companion comes in. We'll get our money out. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll get our money out. I guarantee you. Sure, said Bush, who, on the wagon or not, looked rather worse for wear. Now that Nelson had a good look at him. That's what you say today. But what if Hitler doesn't play ball? Rockefeller glanced very quickly at both men. He'd heard enough. Let's get my table at Le Martinique, 
Say hi to the girls. Have a few laughs. We've been working too damn hard. Hell, it's almost 10 on the Friday night. No wives? What say? So I'm cutting down to uh, basically that dialogue goes on. And he says, uh, Shipper said nothing. Bush kept rolling to the right door uh, and practiced the drinker's calculated stride. Rockefeller let the door close, uh, let the doors closing behind him cue his first question. He's so he's sober these days. Like I'm Kaiser bill. First off, Rennie, who told you about the stock swap? That's a family recipe. Shippers felt a shard of ice in his rib cage. You hear things in my line of work, Mr. Rockefeller rumors. You're nursing Teason's bank deal in Holland, right? How? Yes, yes, I am. For Fritz Thiessen. And it wasn't a question. Yes, Prescott got a piece of that. Shippers shrugged. Not a big piece, Mr. Rockefeller, after all. Uh, it's Prescott, Brown Brothers, Harriman that are the main money. But yes, Prescott's got a piece of Thiessen's bank here. Union Banking Corporation. Thiessen's got himself a bank with two front doors. One here and one in Amsterdam. He shrugged just in case. Rockefeller leant over the table, serious as sin, his face pressed close now to shippers. You know, I don't want to drag this out of you, Rennie, but you know, I'm an oil man. I like, predict I like predictability, he said in a tone that allowed no contradiction. Shippers didn't utter a, a syllable. I don't want my standard stock price yanked up and down, when there's a lot going on, Rockefeller said, his eyes fixed and very, very cool. And there's always a lot going on, Rennie, isn't there? So then it cuts to, that story stops, and they, uh, they provide a June 1936 uh, KGB transcript. And how did this transcript come about? It came about because in 1989... The, the wall came down, the Stasi records were uh, extradited, they were liberated by the people, and documents like these come out. And then years later, you can put them back together. So there's a bunch of code names in here. Uh, for instance, Sonshin is uh, Kim Philby. So you can actually, if you have this book, you can start to dig into the actual documents and the transmissions. This one is uh, particular of note. Here's the next page. It is a letter to David Ben-Gurion by uh, an operative known as Shiloh uh, talking about the ring at Cambridge and that an agent named R uh, had just uh, injured his wrist qualifying at the Olympics. So if you go back to, so this is a historical document. He tells you where he gets it from. If you cross reference it with this historical document of a different origin, this one comes from East Germany, Berlin Olympic games as a rower. His name is Rudy. So that's who R is in this letter. His name is Rudy. And he broke his wrist, apparently. So if you put the pieces together, so this is part of what Loftus did. He would liberate these documents from various secret archives within NATO. Then they would read them, and they would start to put the story together. And then they interviewed people who were also involved in these letters because they were still alive. And then from that, they craft a narrative that reflects uh, the documents. So now, fast forwarding to... Way, way further in the book. Let's see. It's a, uh, this was just a mention of, mention of the Century Club and its instrumentality having uh, various Nazi funders there. But the letter I want to get to, this is uh, New York, November 22nd, 1947. November 22nd is famous because in 1963, that's when Kennedy was assassinated. A few days after this, in 1947, the United Nations voted on whether or not to accept Israel as a state. So it got recognized as a state. This is a conversation that happens a couple days beforehand. Um, and even though the character named Misha is a composite of several various undercover agents that were interviewed by the authors, this story, in the way it's told... Uh, what it means is that Loftus and uh, or Brendan Halley interviewed one of the guys who start out in, in this scene in the elevator. So let's keep that in mind. So as you're reading through a novel and then you can get to the end and see the parts that are real and how it fits together. Um, keep in mind that there are real people involved in the novel 
and that uh, starting out with these two guys in the elevator, coming full circle through the meeting, and then like 50 years later, doing an interview with one of the authors of the book, uh, that's how the information actually makes it to you. Because otherwise, it's just for those people who have that secret clearance. All right, so here we are. New York, November 22nd, 1947. A long, silent elevator ride up to the boardroom. Neither said a word as the car clanked past the lower floors. This is how a hanging feels, Misha thought. And I volunteered for this. The dossier under his arm seemed to weigh many pounds. It might fall through the floor and burn into the bowels of Rockefeller Center if he loosened his grip. Done this before? Misha said at last, as they watched the elevator's indicator arm sweep upwards. Yes, Elam said, not looking at him. Elam had his hands in his pockets. He had brought no overcoat for the visit to New York and had borrowed a shearling coat that was too big for him. He was younger than Misha. Shiloh had sent a child, except this one had the metallic gaze of a salamander. Misha cleared his throat. He's expecting us? He had a phone call from Jerusalem to get him thinking. Misha watched the arm rise past 15. He could feel his pulse in his hands. Elam looked over at him, measuring him from head to foot. Wipe your lip. You're sweating. Don't worry. It won't take 10 minutes. And then he fell silent as the floors clicked by. At 29, the doors opened and a snappily dressed young man said, Good evening. Didn't wait for a reply, then turned on his heel and led the pair, uh, led them to a pair of double oak doors. He opened the doors and remained outside. Misha wouldn't soon forget Make sure it's focused. Focus. There we go. Misha wouldn't soon forget the expensive snick as the doors shut behind him. Elam didn't pause. He kept moving down the short corridor, past the oil paintings and the bronze Degas figurine in its bell jar. Misha followed, his, his shoes settling gently into the perfect carpet at each step. Ahead of them, a wall of dark drapes covered what must have been the most expensive view in all of Manhattan. Still moving, Elam snapped a finger and then pointed to the door on the left. There he stopped and rapped four times, quite slowly. It seemed absurdly easy. Elam knocked and the door opened. Misha recognized the face instantly from the photographs. Hello, fellas, come on in, Nelson Rockefeller said, his eyes cool. Craggily, craggily, craggily handsome, a large forehead and swept back hair, hunched slightly at the shoulders, Rockefeller wore a wintry smile that vanished when Elam only nodded and kept moving toward an armchair near the desk. <clears throat> Misha took the second chair, the dossier on his knee. It's a momentum game, Shiloh had told them. Welcome, gentlemen, Rockefeller said. Can I offer you a drink? We don't drink, Elam said. Then, after a pause, thank you. You have some idea what this is about? Rockefeller, who was in his shirt sleeves, frowned slightly. No, I had a call but it didn't make any sense to me. Something about some papers. Yes, that's why we contacted your lawyer, Mr. Dulles. He's aware of the urgency of this matter, Elam said. God, he's calm, Misha thought. I'm fighting to keep the jitters out of my legs, and it's like he's ordering coffee. That made Rockefeller pause. Yeah, well, Dulles wasn't available. He shifted slightly, waiting, his hospitality cooling. Elam held out his hand for the dossier, and Misha passed it over. This is the dossier Jerusalem told you about, Elam explained. 
We've selected what amounts to the tip of the iceberg. It's interesting reading. He passed the folder over and then surprised Misha by standing up and walking over to the big window beside Rockefeller's desk. He stopped and stared out over the skyline through the Venetian blinds. The effect on Rockefeller was palpable. His eyes went from the dossier to Elam and then to Misha, who consciously slowed his heart rate, something that didn't register on his temple for each pulse. Rockefeller's eyes hit the first page, the current account records from 1943. He turned slightly involuntarily toward Elam, his eyes moving as he read. Elam chose that moment to move slowly from the window to the drinks tray. There, cool, constrained, he poured a large scotch for Rockefeller, then put the glass down on the open file folder, right beside the contents of the banking file. Turn the page, Elam said. Incredibly, Rockefeller did so. Next was the share structure of a very well-known Swiss bank courtesy of files no one next to God in Switzerland had ever seen, except the sweet young thing at the Zurich Public Registry Office who happened to know Israel Kiffer, uh, Kifferman's son. The next page is very informative. I think even a journalist might follow its implications, Elon said. Rockefeller's hairline was suddenly shiny, rivets of perspiration gathering there. He turned the page and moved his glasses back with a finger. Page three was a record of a 1944 share transfer. A transfer tantamount to treason in any U.S. jurisdiction, complete with U.S. Treasury, doc, uh, Department, complete with US Treasury Department letterhead. Rockefeller studied that one for a very long time. He looked up, ignoring the scotch. What's Ben-Gurion want? Elam was already reaching for the files. Votes, he said simply. Latin, American, uh, Latin America votes for partition. We need all 15. You can get us our votes. You say goodbye to this embarrassment. You can put the dossier right in your safe. Rockefeller said nothing. Rockefeller said nothing turning page after page, some faster, some slower, the U.S. government documents giving him the most pause. At the last page, he closed the file, ran a finger across his hairline. Misha expected a rant or a confession, but there was only silence in the dim sounds of the city beyond the plate glass. There was no trace of stress in the man now. He raised his hand, and when he spoke, his voice was flat and slow. Almost a recitation, not a reaction. Think you can walk in here and waltz off with the whole damn store? Rockefeller rolled the dossier into a cylinder. Fixing Elam, he began tapping the desktop with it. Condition one. What I've read never sees the light of day, clear? That's understood. You got that right, Rockefeller said. If a word of this leaks out, you can tell Ben Gurion he'll be drilling for oil in his own backyard because I'll personally guarantee that's the only place on the planet he can find it. Understand that? Condition two, you want your country? You get your country, but only if you give up your pound of flesh at Nuremberg. Not a single German banker goes on trial. Not one. Rockefeller tapping the cylinder he'd made from the file and pointing it at Elam. But you don't get both. Vengeance or a homeland. That's the deal. I've got to consult Jerusalem about that, Elam said, his voice flat. Consult all you like. Ben-Gurion has one card, Rockefeller said easily, and you've just played it. Condition three. The Nazis we used as intelligence assets, they stay secret too. Total immunity. You don't touch them. You don't leak a word to the press. They're vanished. Lock, stock, and barrel. Clear? Now all Elam could do was nod. The room had gone silent except for the ticking 
of a big clock. I'm sorry, the ticking of the clock on a big oak sideboard. You seem a sensible sort of fellow. Good. Condition four. You'll have your votes, but not a single American businessman or banker gets tarred with this. Not me, not anyone. We didn't win the goddamn war to put half of Wall Street on trial, Rockefeller. I'm sorry. We didn't win the goddamn war to put half of Wall Street on trial. Rockefeller raised the scotch glass to his two guests. Thanks for coming. I need to make a call, Elam said. He'd gone gray. For his part, Misha would have given Rockefeller a nudge out the window at that point. He jammed his fingernails deep into his palms to contain his anger. I thought you might, Rockefeller replied, taking a sip of scotch. They waited two hours for Jerusalem to call back. It seemed like two days. They sat in a side office about to be painted, its furniture covered in white drop cloths, a reminder of how short their stay was to be in Rockefeller's world. They sat in silence, reckoning the room was bugged. When the call came, Elam and Jerusalem agreed that the line had to be tapped. So they chose Hungarian, Elam's second language, and kept it short, knowing full well if the line was monitored, they'd buy a few hours at most. Elam was, uncon Elam was inconsolable. No one at Shiloh's send-off had expected the counterpunch. Did we choose the wrong man? Elam asked wearily. Start at the top, work your way down, that's the way, Misha said. He's a work, isn't he? But Elam was lost in his own thoughts. I think I'm going to be sick. Don't give him the satisfaction. Elam nodded. We'll get the votes, that's something. He had his hands... Uh, he had uh, he had his head in his hands, and Misha could see the ring of sweat on his collar. You know, he said slowly, I'm beginning to think that God... Elam picked up the ringing telephone and listened to it briefly. He put the receiver down, biting his lip for a moment, and exhaled. He still gripped the phone as if it might float away, looking up with eyes of devoid of hope, and said, It's yes. They said yes. They went back into Rockefeller's office, and in three minutes... Three minutes. Misha checked his watch for history's sake. They were out. The deal confirmed. The young man in the natty suit reappeared, as if out of a hat, and summoned the elevator. A pitiless glint in his eye as he waited with, the, uh, with them in silence. What was there to say? In the elevator down, Elam passed his hand through his hair. If we don't get the votes, he said quietly, slipping his hands back into his pockets, I'll climb every stair in this place to get to that creep. And then I'll break his neck. And then the other guy, too. Mr. Suit? Him first. Misha believed him. Now. This mech... Uh, so I don't want to read too much at once, but it does flow into the next part, which is uh, six days later. The United Nations... They're there. Foster Dulles is there. They're having negotiations to get these votes to uh, vote on Israel and uh, the Palestine partition and Israel being a function of that that comes out of the partition. So at one point, there was an interesting part. I'm going to take a sip. That uh, a recount of a conversation that went on with somebody from Cuba. And I think it was a good example of putting it in the light of people he, that were being asked to give up their votes to vote for, uh, to vote against the Arabs is how they see it here in the script. So let's get down to, this is John Foster talking to a Cuban named Alejandro he said, all right, Alejandro, our families have done business for over half a century, the railroads, the cane mills, the United fruit. It's all on the line today. What do you want for a yes vote? We are good sons of the church, Foster. We will vote as the Holy Father instructed. We want nothing. Nothing? I've got the authority to swing you whatever you want. Financing for your father's unfinished rail, ride, uh, rail line to Cien Fuegos? Underwrite a telephone system that you and your brother own? What? What do you need? Sebastiano was smiling, the smile of a man who knew perfectly 
perfectly well where the end of the game lay. It's all true, he observed. Of course it is. Firm offers. Write yourself a deal of a lifetime, Alejandro. Foster hesitated, eyeballing the smaller man hard. What's true? What are you getting at? The Zionists. They have you by the cojones. His Excellency, the Brazilian ambassador, tells me the fix is in. What the hell are you talking about? You talk like a salesman promising and promising, Sebastiano lit, lit a cigarette, a lace of blue threading over his perfect hair. I keep my word, Alejandro. Your father knew that. Who's done more for you than I have? The tobacco franchises, the rail and telephone business issues, uh, the bond issues. You know that. That's what I'm afraid of. The rumors are all true. What isn't a rumor around here, Alejandro? It's a marketplace over out there. No rumor. No rumor, then. Fact after fact, the Cuban declared. The preliminary vote says the Zionists will lose. No? By six, seven votes. No hope. The Arabs win. Yes? Ah, but no, senor. The vote is postponed. And suddenly all the Latin countries in the Vatican's bank, uh, back pocket, they swoon, all of them. Santa Teresa. Again, they think, and think again their vote. Por qué? After his visit, the telephone call from your friend and client, Mr. Rockefeller, of course. Convent girls, those, uh, <laughs> convent girls fa uh, falling those men. So he's like, uh, like they're young girls fainting to get a call from Rockefeller. They faint to his touch, no? Costa Rica, Venezuela, Honduras. Sebastiano laughed like a busy signal. Staccato and harsh, he waved his tanned hand meaningly. Mr. Rockefeller is a Svengali when, it comes to call, when he comes to call. He knows all. He sees all. He knows where the secret, uh, where the bank president from uh, Tilikulapa has his millions and his mistresses. Where the general from Buenos Aires re receives La Heroina. And how electricity came to Bolivia with the silent Germans who hide there in the mountains. A very big mystery to people. Mr. Rockefeller knows where all the skeletons are. It is no matter to him to twist the knife for a vote to abstain. What are we to him? You know things, Alejandro. I pity the Arabs, Sebastiano reflected, ignoring Foster. I never thought I would, but I do. Their terrible leaders, corruption, even worse than in my Cuba. And my God, their high priests, or whatever they're called. Vengeance is all they offer, no hope. The Jews will drive them out like rabbits, and there will be war after war. Those unhappy, unlucky people. He shook his head and then gazed at Foster steadily, preparing to deliver a Cuban nugget of philosophy. My father has been dead for 25 years. But he and my mother, God rest her soul, they gave me two good eyes. Mr. Rockefeller has nothing in his hand to harm me or my family. Alejandro Sebastiano took a long, last drag from his cigarette and gave the most eloquent Cuban shrug. Ah, but who knows what this terrible scandal is. Foster raised his hand as if to make a point, but words failed him for a moment too long. We'll vote as the Holy See asks. Who needs another war over Jerusalem? It's madness. Sebastiano flicked his expensive cigarette into the basin. And remember, we took Jews when you and your heroic president refused them. You can keep your abstention, my friend, and all that comes with it. He stepped past. Buenos dias, Foster. Alejandro. He stopped in the open door. You know, Foster... I thank, thank you for all you did for my father and my family. But you know what they say around here, the Spanish-speaking countries? They say, uh, they say you see a brown face and your mind goes blind, that you cannot see us. I tell you something, someday you will see us and all the brown people. Now, if you excuse me, I must use the men's room. So he goes to another chapter. Now, the part that... Uh, I found interesting was that the United Kingdom, of course, having a hand in all of this, uh, Balfour Declaration, uh, World War One, 
uh, Paris 1919, all the way up through World War II, they abstained from the vote in 1947. They abstained from voting on the project that they helped to initiate. 1916. Postscript. I was going to read this first, but I thought given uh, what John said in those 11 minutes in the clip, it was uh, enough to get you this far where you can read. If you make it to the end of the book, let's get it all clear. This is a novel, but much of what you have read is based on known fact. Although the most intriguing elements are still classified. Some isn't. There were no Neemans, for instance, but Baron von Schroeder knew Foster Dulles well, and Sullivan and Cromwell record of a uh, record of involvement in cloaking Nazi assets is clear. Reuven Shiloh did in fact mastermind the Mossad from the networks we recount. Eleanor did work with the Quakers in France in 1917 and had a peculiar habit of turning up in Allen's life at critical points just as we suggest, not least in Trieste in 1946, but that's for another book. So is the interrogation Foster endured about his cloaking practices at the hands of some highly motivated treasury lawyers in 1942. Thanks to our colleague, Professor C's Viebs for drawing this to Brendan's attention. From 1953 to 1962, Allen was the head of the CIA. He produced wartime intelligence of often highly dubious quality, a fact noted by Nuremberg trial judge Michael Musmano. In a memorandum long classified, Judge Musmano ex excoriated Allen for obtaining immunity from war crimes prosecution for his SS contacts, including. Uh, including many of his Bern, Switzerland, SS interlocutors in exchange for a separate Italian surrender. And the Vatican did work hand in glove with the murky proponents of the rat lines, the Nazi rat lines. The saga of the Balkans war crime suspects in the Vatican rat line alone, John and Brendan uh, met while Brendan was researching the CBC TV investigative documentary on Canada's role in the affair is stomach turning equally disturbing. The Vatican did own a series of interlocking joint ventures stretching from Italy to in Switzerland to Lisbon and South America. Never mind interests large, uh, uh, it, largest, large and small in banks and insurance companies in Mussolini's Italy, Vichy, France, fascist, Spain and fascist, Portugal. Brendan's recent research on behalf of American investigative reporter Gerald Posner suggests the insurance companies of Italy bear serious examination uh, regarding Nazi capital flight. When God closes a window, he opens a door, as the saying goes. Many of those closest to Allen, despite liking him, acknowledged that he was corrupt. His post-war Berlin station colleagues essentially admitted to longtime CIA reporter Joe Trento acting as Allen's procurer. Uh, Trento's interview with Jim, Jim, James Jesus Angleton is the old counter-spy's deathbed. I'm sorry. Trento's interview with James Jesus Angleton on the old counter spies deathbed is one of the most important assessments of Allen's time at CIA. Several of Allen's non CIA colleagues were far less kind. One who'd briefed Allen with accurate estimates of Soviet economic data, all were ignored, termed him a whore and a liar. Speaking to where they got the information for the parts that I read, John personally interviewed the Haganah agent who first who had firsthand knowledge of the blackmail of Nelson Rockefeller. Prescott Bush was indeed up to his eyeballs in the union banking affair. And some believe, as John does, Brendan is not so sure that the Bush family fortune stemmed from this single union share. Huh. Interesting. Two presidents of the United States came from that. Certainly the Berlin burn wire uh, wiretapping story is true. John has seen the. Uh, Luftschorhungsgamt intercept that opens the novel in a slightly different form at Fort Meade, the, ne the National Security Agency's massive archive, when his NATO level security clearances allowed him to roam the vaults at will. 
Then it talks about uh, El Eleanor died at Eleanor Dulles died at 101, age 101 in 1996. And Misha, Misha is a composite of several underground Haganah act uh, operatives, now all long dead. And Eleanor's Walt's wartime lover, whom she details in her autobiography in uh, ruminative and discreet terms. Eleanor did help mastermind the rescue and escape of her paramour's mother from Warsaw, whom she never named and whose identity is sti uh, still deep in classified FBI and State Department files. That's interesting. In 1999, whilst researching a different book in a Berlin, still not yet again, uh, the German capital, Brendan did hear of rumors. I'm sorry, that part's irrelevant because it's speculative. We'll keep that out. About the authors. Let's see who brought us all this fine writing. Brendan Halley is a novelist, investigative reporter, and screenwriter. He lives in Stratford, Ontario. The Witness Tree is his third novel. thought it was very well written. John Loftus is a whistleblower's attorney, an expert in intelligence matters, an author of best-selling books, The Secret War Against the Jews, The Unholy Trinity, How the Vatican's Nazi Networks Betrayed Western Intelligence to the Soviets, and this book, The Witness Tree. All right, so at this point, let's open it up to anyone with observations, questions, complaints about how I do this and how I run this show. Whatever you want, I'll take a few Q&A because uh, I still got plenty of tea left. I'll take a sip. Is there anybody out there? What's that? The Zoom call dropped? It all didn't get recorded? Oh, no. Hey, Richard, I just wanted to congratulate you on uh, another fine example of uh, a great book. Well, thank you, Michael. I wasn't sure what book to bring out today, and I, I felt like I wasn't going to find one. I was going to have to delay, but then I saw this book, and I was like, oh, yeah, there's parts out of that book I want to read. So... Uh, very happy to be here to share it. I was, I'll be even more happy when I get the footage of Loftus that we have the five hours or so uh, edited in, in a film with the other footage that I've shot. And that's, uh, that's seeming like much more of a potential in the next several months to get working on that than it has been for the past many months. So I'm excited about that as well. Just got to put it in the schedule and get it done. That's, that's what I'm learning, right? Uh, I think uh, I think you've really put a human face on some of these characters, or you know, you've you've kind of created the opportunity to put a face on these characters in a way that uh, I, I I really feel like people need to uh, look into. And, and certainly, this is a uh, a area that I would love to introduce to some people. And so, providing with providing us with this kind of information in a in a platform that other people can digest it, I think, can really open some eyes. So, again, a uh, really big thank you. Well, I appreciate the compliment and it inspires me for the next time when we do the Secret Affairs book. This is a heavier duty book, there's a lot of facts in here, so I'll have to figure out which parts. I mean, I ran out of the red flags when I. Let me show you the book real quick, because that's what this show's about, right? Do it live. So, in this book, I've got some red tabs, but if you also look, I've got all these dog-eared pages because I ran out of red tabs while I was reviewing it, and I ran out of highlighter. So this is a case where I was reading a book and I wasn't prepared. So now I am going to go back, find the key passages, highlight them so that you can find them more easily and readily, and uh, suck the value out of that book insofar as why you would want to purchase it. So if I showcase some nuggets, like you would buy it just to figure out, you know, learn more about Osama bin Laden's headquarters in, in London, in the 90s before 9-11 right what's the relationship of osama bin laden and his proxy terrorist network to cia and mi6 and probably mossad right because if it came about after 1947 which is what uh operation cyclone where zabinyu brzezinski david rockefeller's protege so it's not nelson it's, this is nelson here by the way in case you guys yeah yeah uh now, David Rockefeller's protege, Brzezinski, is national security advisor for Carter, and he's the one who does the deal with Mujahideen, and Osama bin Laden's on the scene. 
and he's coming from Saudi to go over in Afghanistan and fight the Soviets. So they had been longtime business partners. But if the American people aren't aware of just the generalities, like the 30 second story, just what I gave you, if they don't know that, they'll go to war for 18 years in places that had nothing to do with the event they went to war over. And I can't help but feeling that this is deleterious to our own freedom. It brings down our reputation around the world as far as like the poor conducting of statecraft and the absence of democracy and diplomatic uh, communications going on. It's just like order more smart bombs, drop them over there, order more tomahawks, put them over here. You know, it's just order more yeah. equipment and dispose of it on the other side of the world. It's like a, it's a form of capitalism that needs to go obsolete of its own accord or because somebody else develops something better that makes that way go obsolete because otherwise if left to its own devices it's just destroying humanity like one smart bomb or landmine at a time yeah yeah he mentions that the saudi connection in that in that interview in the beginning um are you up to speed on what's going on in saudi arabia these days in regard to the war in yemen and, and how it looks like you know they pretty much have lost their own morale of their of their army and so you know the u.s is sending troops over there to essentially try and you know keep the regime alive i don't know you, you no, I, I i really don't keep up with current events because as a as a forensic historian it, the information is not there yet that i can find useful to actually establishing lines of fact right it's there's still a lot of noise uh, or if it's like muddy water, you have to filter it or let it settle out. So yeah. I would look at, I mean, that's really in the last 10 years that they've ramped that up. But if you look at the history of Saudi Arabia as juxtaposed to Western intelligence in the past yeah. 100 years, it gives you, like, you can see more clearly what's going on today. And when uh, when these aspects are happening, like, it's just not the Saudis that are attacking them. And it's like the British and American. Right. Are, you know, Right, they're kind of the that that's army. driven from top down. That's from the arms dealers to the government to the policies to the actions, right? So there's that aspect too. That there's international arms dealers and black marketeers that puppet what we call our democracy, and people out there voting for right hand or left hand. I think they're usually nescient about that overarching supra structure. I mean, let's see, uh, call it the super class. This is the, uh, David Rothkopf's book, Superclass. Let me cut to that. Let me show you. Because that also will be a future smart reading. Like, they got the world on the key ring. Right? And who is this printed by? Well, this is a conspiracy book published by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> we'll get to it. I don't want to bore you with more things. Oh, maybe we can get to it. Let's see. Superclass, the global power elite and the world they are making without your permission. Yeah, so we'll get to that one. To make sense out of a book like that, you got to get to a book like this first. Yeah. And we'll have classic books. I got The Power Elite from C. Uh, C. Wright Mills. That was really the first book in 1953 that was written prior to Tragedy and Hope that was explaining kind of the overarching supra governmental elements that have influenced top down on what we see as bottom up as, oh, the president runs things. No, it's a proxy placeholder type of situation, frontman. Entertainment. Ooh. That's why they had a Reagan. Reagan was an actor. The real activities. Yep. Watch the vice presidents. What are they up to? You know, they're running yeah. covert operations. Especially Bush. He definitely was a bad guy. Yeah. And the only reason that we know the Bush family at all is because back in the day, they were playing ball with the Nazis. They were helping to facilitate companies that were enabling the Nazis. And yeah. so Prescott Bush's, I mean, his claim to fame starts there. Then he became a senator and then his son became uh, in the CIA and then became CIA director without officially ever being in the CIA, which was interesting. Then immediately after that, he's involved as vice president, then becomes president for two terms. And then there's another president for two terms. And then that guy's son, Bush Jr., W, he becomes president. So that's a lot of, I mean, there's 300 and some million people in this country. Are those really the people who are most qualified for the job? Maybe we should look at how we, like, uh, how do we hire for that position? That's, that position seems to have a lot of power. And maybe the people who are getting power are taking power behind the scenes, and that's how they get that position, and it has nothing to do with our votes. Maybe that's going on. 
That's a good thing to consider because that might be the reality. That might be the reality of the Holy See. That might be the reality of how popes are chosen. Who's got the most blackmail? Who's got the the offer? You know, when you slap down the folder, if somebody else has the other move, you lose. You saw that. Those people were very confident they were going to blackmail Rockefeller, except it wasn't the first time he'd been blackmailed. Not the first time. So he's like, okay, I know how to handle this. I'll, I'll see that, but here's my conditions. That's a powerful lesson. And uh, there was no tape recorder in the room, so far as I know. So it's based on testimony of somebody who was there in person. But it gives you a good idea how the mechanics of that situation work. And I'm not saying to take it as factual and actual. You should dig into Loftus's other books to understand the nature of uh, what they're unfolding in that novel, for sure. And um, like I said, I can only think of probably three novels that I would cover in this series, which would be Brave New World, 1984, and this book, The Witness Tree. Anyone else have questions, comments, or complaints? Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Michael. Ah, good to see you there at the end. Had a couple comments. Step up to the mic, Ferdinand. How you doing? I'm doing well, and you? I'm doing pretty well having this under my belt because there was a lot of challenges I had to overcome today to get this far. So I'm feeling good. Good. Yeah, it's that, that's one of the problems of being in this course is um, my reading list is expanding at a exponential rate much faster than I'm capable of reading. But, you know, anyhow, I for, first comment pertinent to um, one of the passages you shared where um, the Cuban representative basically indicated that he wasn't going to play ball with the, with, I believe he was talking to Prescott representing Rockefeller. And um, I checked the, the vote on partition in 47 and Cuba was the only Latin American country that voted no. Um, there were six countries that abstained, but most of them did vote yes. Um, so that's just uh, historical. Thank you for getting us the facts on that. So here's the backstory. In World War II, when Nelson Rockefeller is working for U.S. government, military, in psychological warfare, he has his hands in Latin America and South America because that's where his family had connections. Mm -hmm. So after the war, he has this, uh, this influence and control, and he's also involved with uh, you know, having influence in those countries at the United Nations vote. So that, that history of him yanking the chain had been so long that Cuba finally was ready to stand up for itself. He's like, we're not, we're not playing. Now, knowing that, 1947 to 1963 is not that long, right? right. Uh, 1960, when was the Bay of Pigs? 62? So in between time, there's the attempts to undermine Cuba that are multiple. So you got Operation Mongoose, Operation 40, you had uh, Bay of Pigs, and then Kennedy pulled his support. He fired Dulles. Well, who did he just fire? He fired, I'm sorry, who did he just fire? He fired MI6's spy in American intelligence, whose brother, <clears throat> whose brother is MI6's spy in the State Department. And how did all this overthrow go on? According to Loftus and um, uh, Burton Hirsch, who wrote The Old Boys, which is the, uh, the origins of the CIA, being Wall Street bankers and lawyers. Those two books um, illustrate that you've got a, a group of people that have been doing business behind the scenes with black markets, with cartels, with gangsters. And then after World War uh, II, they want to disband OSS. And when they create CIA, CIA is Nazi hunting, hunting. Well, they got to bring these Nazis into America. So there's a State Department insertion into CIA. And this is called OPC, Office of Policy Coordination. So hmm. Foster's State Department on behalf of MI6 inserts OPC into CIA. And so while external ring of CIA, the people who want to defend the country, rah, rah, they're hunting Nazis, the backdoor people, uh, the Dulles with the stovepipe system, they're bringing Nazis in 
by the tens of thousand to hide them, right? So there's that dynamic that is continually fighting. So by the time Kennedy gets to it and he's like, Dulles, you're out of here. He knows he's, he's like cutting off the Anglophiles because the Irish and the English are not friendly to start with. And even though Joe Kennedy was an ambassador to Great Britain and all these sort of things, there's an Irish English tension that existed and that the Kennedys were trying to ingratiate themselves into that level of society and they would never be accepted. So when Joe Kennedy gets killed, Joe Kennedy Jr. in Operation Aphrodite in England uh, going into the continent during World War II, he's in a plane laden with explosives that's supposed to be remote control de detonated and he's supposed to parachute out the safety. So uh, he gets wiped out. JFK then gets slid in. Uh, Joe Kennedy Sr. buys his son a presidency by catering to the mafia vote. The mafia is also working with intelligence since 1938 from Operation Underworld. So it's almost as if Joe Kennedy got too big for his britches, started to try to buy and ingratiate himself and his family into an ongoing plan where other people like Kennedy beat Nixon, right? So Kennedy beats Nixon because Nixon would have been president had Kennedy, Jack Kennedy, not been in the race, not got the votes bought by his dad. Mm -hmm. Who is Nixon? Nixon's the guy. And it's not in this book, but I'm going to hold it up. Nixon's the guy who goes to Dulles and he says, hey, I'm a lawyer. I work for the Department of Navy. He's probably Office of Naval Intelligence. He goes to Alan Dulles. He says, hey, I have the records on you and your boss doing business with the Nazis and I'm going to prosecute you. And then Alice du Alan Dulles becomes uh, Nixon's campaign advisor. He's like, oh, we're going to make you president. <laughs> First, they got him as vice president right away, right? Because he was uh, he was vice president there for a while. And then that's how he was going to become president running against Jack Kennedy. So when Joe Kennedy pays people off to get those votes, especially West Virginia coal miners, um, there's this whole shift in the power. And that comes back when Kennedy gets assassinated, not by Lee Harvey Oswald. Because there's too many things that go on, including the Katzenberg memo, which is written by a Rhodes Scholar, uh, that decides that Oswald's the, the guy without, the, without them having the evidence. So when you have pieces of evidence that frame up the guy they blame in the official story before they even had the evidence, and then the guy dies by the end of the weekend and can't tell anybody and can't talk for himself, that's a sketchy situation. So yeah. even a novel like this, it, it can inspire people. Let's say you have a friend and they only like to read novels. Get them a book like this because then they'll be like, is some of this stuff real? Yeah. And you know what? The real stuff is so much more interesting than the novels. But every now and then people write a good novel because there's things in reality that people should know the story behind. And absent of, a, you know, them wanting to take in a really dry documentary or read a whole bunch of classified uh, documents from once upon a time, um, they're not going to get to that knowledge. They're not going to get to it. And then they're always going to think, well, that could never happen because I don't know about it. Right. That group of people who thinks if they don't know about it, it's not going on. Yeah. So that's who we're always trying to bridge the gap with. We who read about these interesting things and look to have conversations with other people who might be also reading interesting things. And we keep ourselves safer and we can overcome uh, frustration and the friction of ignorance faster. So I think reading's fundamental. Any other insights, Ferdinand? Um, earlier on, when. Uh, the novel was mentioning the connection between the, the Nazis and the Muslim Brotherhood. They mentioned um, a gentleman by the name of Qutub. And I recognized that name from Adam Curtis's uh, series of videos, The Power of Nightmares. And he was, um, he was actually a school teacher in Colorado and then he went back to Egypt and um, was part of the Muslim Brotherhood and then got tortured by Nasser and became even more radical. <laughs> um, but I, I'm curious, I, I heard you mention Adam Curtis in, uh, in the past. And are you familiar with that, with that video? I am because I've seen almost all of Adam Curtis's movies multiple times. Right. It's a very interesting palette that he's laying out there. I've it really always, is. Yeah, yeah. I've always admired him uh, as a documentary filmmaker and the fact that he has access to the BBC archives. So he has like superb 
footage that nobody else can lay their hands on, right? right? And then I always wonder, is he related to Mark Curtis? And then I always wonder, is he related to Lionel Curtis? And I can't find the answers of that, so I'm not mm -hmm. going to make an affirmative statement, but I have those yeah. questions yeah. because yeah. – very well informed people of that last name have been very influential in Anglo American history in the last hundred and some years. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, Curtis's documentary on, uh, on Bernays and, mm -hmm. and psychotherapy, That's the, right. of the well, South. Yeah. Um, and then he did the one on Afghanistan and the building of the dams there and the, you know, so he's done like, they're all interesting. I don't yeah. always agree with his perspective or his like, agenda but yeah, you, yeah. i can watch all of his work and find it very interesting and i look up stuff on my own and i try to fit it together so i try not to be an unwitting pawn of you know any of the bbc agenda sure sure well that yeah i'm always on guard for that that sort of thing and but the the question i had about that was certainly they mentioned mr katub and his uh pivotal role in the muslim brotherhood leading to Osama bin Laden and 9-11 and all that, right? And, um, or at least that's the official story. And then, um, but he makes no mention of the Nazi connection that he was likely taught by, uh, you know, Nazis. And um, so, I, you know, I, 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 the question I ask is, was that omission merely nascence or was that intentional? And I don't know, but I, I'm glad that you bring up these other two gentlemen named Curtis who I've never heard of, but, and they may be relation. They may not. I don't know. It's one of those things where I think Mark Curtis a whole mean, bunch of truth doesn't mean it's all the truth. Right, right. Exactly. So Mark Curtis, you can actually follow this author on Twitter and I, I'm pretty sure I do follow him. Um, mm -hmm. he'd probably be about the same age as Adam Curtis. Now, Lionel yeah. Curtis, who was instrumental, I mean, he's the guy that Carol Quigley said, shut off the recorder. If you talk about Lionel Curtis, you'll lose your career and maybe, maybe your life. <laughs> Lionel Curtis would be like a great grandfather to this generation of Curtises, right? So there's uh, two currently living. I'm interested if they're related. And then I'm interested if they're related to Lionel Curtis, who's a very famous figure in British history. In this book that we'll cover next time, Secret Affairs, uh, Muhammad Qutub on page 88. And there's also Saeed Qutub, pages 61, 88, 89 through 90. So I would guess uh, it's safe to say that although they were the, the Nazi fascist uh, type of Arab, they do have intelligence ties to Britons so though we'll, we'll learn about those next time and let me see page 88 would be the page to start from so I'll mark that for next time get Katub in here there it is thank you Ferdinand that's a, a very interesting insight observation now we're gonna see how it unfolds two weeks from now cool all right well I appreciate the book very interesting and um, learned a, a different angle on the whole thing. I mean, I knew to some degree Wall Street and uh, dear old Prescott Bush and the Dulles brothers had their hands dirty. And it's interesting to hear, you know, in a novel form um, to imagine what it was like, the blackmail going on and the different um, intrigues. All right. Well, that, thanks. That's all I had to offer. Right on. Anyone else looking to add to this, uh, this insightful episode? Into Richard, I, I just thought I'd throw in there about uh, Corbett. You know, he uh, had a tribute to Fletcher Prouty. And I think this, that is another kind of angle that uh, people find this interesting. It would certainly be something that they can get another angle of the Dulles brothers from kind of the, a guy on the inside. Yeah, because Fletcher Prouty, I mean, they say the downside of, uh, of Oliver Stone's JFK, a lot of people say, is that, the, oh, Mr. X, he didn't exist. Yeah, he's an amalgamation. He's a false character, just like uh, Misha, like an amalgamation of other people. So part of what's behind Mr. X and JFK is Fletcher Prouty and his recollection of the events, because they are very similar. 
And they might not have been able to get his permission to use his real name, and they have to create a fictitious character because it is a fictional movie, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's art, which is a lie to show the truth, which exists in reality, right? Art is artificial. It's art to official, created by man's hand, and it is something out there. Like, it's not the thing. It points you toward the thing. It gives you insight about the thing, but it's not the thing. It's a reflection of it, right? It's like a counterfeit. Art is like a counterfeit of reality. So if you use it properly, you can use its counterfeit nature to your advantage to show people what is going on in actual reality. In the case of Fletcher Prouty, I don't know that I have a printed book by him. I know I have a ton of audio lectures, these sort of things, uh, some, maybe even some video footage. Um, but I'm not recalling if he put it together in book form, what that would be titled. Do you know of a book? I don't, but I, like I said, uh, I thought, um, you know, I got... I got led to him by uh, Corbett and uh, everything that I was able to dig up in regard to videos and interviews and stuff like that, um, I thought was yeah, rather had, well put together. I've had a lot of Fletcher Prouty stuff, I mean, probably in 9-11 Synchronicity podcast and definitely in Peace Revolution podcast. And I probably still have some Fletcher Prouty planned for future Peace Revolution episodes because there's many of those once I get to that part of my workflow. Always work waiting. It's good to do. It's fun when you're making your own list of work to do. Looking forward to that. Hey, me too. Me too. All right. Thanks for that final note there. Does anyone else have uh, comments or questions on this book, the topics that we have talked about today? Uh, the Witness Tree, Rockefeller, Standard Oil, Nazis, dead people piling up on the other half of the scale where they were get, collecting their money. Right? That's the absence of, see, the problem is they don't have a belief. Their belief is money. And so they just stack it up and they're not waiting. You know, it's uh, very, in that aspect where you put profit again, above people where they're dying, it's very sociopathic. And I dare say it's psychopathic, except I don't think that they were unconscious to their responsibility in it. And then if you call them a psychopath, you're kind of saying they didn't have, they're not responsible for their actions. So at the very least, sociopathic actions that continue to go on and plague our government today. And I don't see how we're going to resolve what's going on today unless we learn a little bit about the history that makes it that way. And then only then can we start to articulate that to others, get the knowledge bar up there a little bit. So it's like uh, freedom, despotism, smart people, people who don't care and are apathetic and don't internalize any useful information. That's despotism level. So if we could just uh, raise the consciousness a little bit and how do we do that? Learn how to have interesting things to talk about, learn how to ask interesting questions, have interesting conversations and uh, knowledge becomes wisdom only when shared. So if you get a little knowledge, you have a responsibility to share it. All right. Without any uh, further takers on the offer of feedback or Q and a, I'm going to wrap this episode up. Um, and next time we'll be in the studio next door uh, doing history connected. I might have to start putting secret affairs into the history blueprint before we can even talk about it because otherwise all the facts in here just go in one ear and out the other. So maybe we'll uh, have that next week and then we'll cover the quotes from it in the week afterwards. Thank you for everybody who has showed up today and for all of you who waited while I was a little bit late getting the show started. Good for you talking to each other, making plans, taking action. And uh, I'll be back this, uh, this Friday with another lecture. So hang in there. I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great day. Thank you for tuning in and not dropping out. Peace.